Hello, my name is Bernard Toninho and I'll be presenting you our work on Featherweight Go together with uh, my co-authors Julian Lange and Raymond Hu. So you can see that this is joint work with quite a few other people. So Robert Griezmer and Ian Taylor from Google's uh, Go team, uh, Wen Kokle and Phil Wadler from Edinburgh and uh, also Nobuko Yoshida from Imperial College. Before getting into the specifics of our work, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Go and how this work came about. So Go was designed at Google by Robert Griesmer, uh, Rob Pike, and Ken Thompson. So Go is widely used both at Google and really in, in industry in general. And its notable features are imperative programming with structs and functions or methods. It has stru static structural typing or duct typing, if you will. It's a garbage collected language and it has good runtime performance. But it has a notably absent feature, namely generics. So developers have been quite vocal about this absence. So if you look at data from the Go developer survey just from last year, 15% of all survey participants highlighted the lack of generics as the biggest challenge in, in using Go. So by this point, the Go team really wanted to explore generics for Go. And so Rob Pike, you can see on the left, asked Phil Wadler, who you can see on the right, if he'd be interested in helping find the right form of polymorphism for Go. By this time, all the academics and say the team that later resulted in this paper got together with Robert Griesmer and Ian Taylor, who were members of the Go team. And so by this time, the Go team had already a draft design for generics based on a notion of contracts. And these are not a feature that are absent from Go. So uh, based on discussions with the Go team and the original contract proposal, we sort of extracted the main design constraints from for generics, which essentially would have to be simple to use and understand, so not as complicated as something like C++ templates. Uh, so it had a low runtime cost, ideally none, and in some sense it had to be a conservative extension to go as much as possible. So our approach, based on this, was to sort of think of Go structural typing and subtyping with generics, which would then allow type constraints with sort of no extra language features, and also to consider a compilation strategy based on monomorphization. Considering the existing works that exist in this space, and obviously featherweight Java was something quite present in our minds, but when thinking about monomorphization, especially in an academic setting, well, really very few formal studies on, on this topic exist. So you can have a look at our paper for a more extended discussion on this. And really, if you think about the combination of monomorphization and with structural typing or subtyping as it exists in Go, really this combination is quite absent from, from the literature of statically typed languages. So obviously, for academics, this means that we need new formal models. So, great. So our work was to develop Featherweight Go, as we have called it, which is a minimal model for some of the key features for Go. And we then extend it with generics to produce Featherweight Generic Go. And we've also studied a formalization of monomorphization that then allows us to essentially compile FGG back into FG. You'll hear about the details of this a bit later. So, okay, what is Featherweight Go or FG? FG is a tiny, Turing complete language that nonetheless distills the core uh, elements of Go. So it has structs, as Go does, which are essentially records. It has methods, so functions that you can attach to structs. It has interfaces, which are just sets of method signatures, and it is structurally typed. So structs will implement an interface implicitly. And we've designed the language in such a way, or the model in such a way, that valid FG programs are indeed valid Go programs. So let's see what the language actually looks like. So this is an interface for equality, which we have named EQ. And so it has just one method, equal, which takes uh, an argument of type EQ and returns a Boolean. Now we can make an existing type, such as integer, implement this interface by adding to it the corresponding equal method. And in FG, to implement this method, you need a type assertion or a cast of the that parameter to back to int so that you can then test for the equality. We can also make new types have equality. For instance, we can define a pair type with a left and a right element that if we want to have an EQ on pair, we have the elements themselves implement EQ. And then we can define equality for pairs, the equal method, in this sort of expected pointwise way. Again, we need to cast uh, the that parameter to a pair in order to access its left and, and right fields. And if we put it all together, we can have a program with a pair of ints and we can ask 
if the pair is equal to itself, and hopefully it will print out true. So I won't really bore you by going through all the rules, but really you can tell that fg is actually quite tiny. And you can see that all the rules that define both its statics and semantics fit in this slide. And fg is formally reasonable, so it has progress and preservation as you might expect. So having established featherweight go, we then move to featherweight generic go. So the idea here was to add type parameters to structs, methods, and interfaces that you've seen before from FG. And here type parameters will have an interface bound, which allows us to essentially represent ad hoc polymorphism. And methods will be attached to generic structs, but bounds of the generic struct can be specialized. So let's sort of revisit our example of equality. This is the non-generic interface that you've seen before. Its generic uh, version is parameterized by a type A, which is bounded by the, the interface EQ. And the equal method now just takes a parameter of type A. If we now consider equality for integers or ints, instead of the parameter of type EQ, we have a parameter uh, of type int, and we no longer need to perform the cast. Similarly, pairs that before were sort of hard-coded to support equality of its members are now generalized. So by parameterizing the type by some type A and B bound by any type, which is just an alias for the empty interface, which does not constrain a type, we can refine equality of pairs to then not require any casts. Notice that the equal method is defined only for pairs of elements that implement the EQ interface instead of for any arbitrary pair. So to then use generics, we now require explicit type annotations, but in actual generic Go, these will be inferred. So as you can see from the complete set of rules for FGG, it is slightly more complex than FG, but still quite minimal. It still fits in one slide with fairly readable font and it's still a semantically reasonable language. Okay, I'm going to end off the talk to Julian, who's going to tell you a little bit about how monomorphization of FGG programs works. We use monomorphization as a translation from FGG to FG. The idea is that each parametric type or method in FGG is translated to a family of types or methods in FG. But there is one for each possible instance that may occur at runtime. Our translation has two requirements. It must preserve typing. That is, if a program is well typed in FGG, its translation must also be well typed in FG. The translation must also preserve and reflect the semantics of FGG. That is a well typed program in FGG must have exactly the same behavior as its translation. The Go team was interested in monomorphization in the first instance because of its low runtime overhead. For us, it also gives us a concrete semantics for generics that we can explain to Go users and a direct implementation strategy. An added bonus is that type assertion is then less restrictive that with, than with an erasure strategy. The downsides of monomorphization, of course, is that it requires a whole program analysis. It might lead to an exponential blow up of the code, and not all programs are monomorphizable. Let's look at an example. We have here a simple program that defines a list interface with a map uh, method. The list interface is implemented by nil, which is the empty list. And we use list of int and list of bool in the main method. So if we analyze this program, we notice quite easily that we need list of int, list of bool, and nil of int. This is because we need list of int there, list of bool here, and nil of int there. We also observe that we need map to bool that is defined on list of int. So these four instances are fairly straightforward to compute. What is a bit less straightforward is to notice that we also need to define map to bool or nil of int. And this is because nil of int is a subtype and implementation of a list of int. And going through the body of this method here, instantiated with b is bool, we will need to create also nil of bool. Once we have this list of instances, we can generate code. And for this, there will be a new type in FG or a new method for each of these elements. So in this case, we have list of int and list of bool, notably. We have nil of bool and nil of int as well. You'll notice that we don't have map to int, and this is because map to int is not used in the source program. To formalize uh, our monomorphization strategy, we have defined two sets of rules. One set takes care of collecting these instances in a conservative way, while the other set of rules takes care of renaming the program and generating, generating code uh, accordingly. As I said, not all FGG programs are monomorphizable. In particular, programs that use polymorphic recursion may not be monomorphizable. For instance, this method nest is recursive, and at each 
recursive call, it adds a level of nesting to this box type here. So if we had to analyze this method statically and conservatively, we will see that we would need infinitely many uh, instances of this box type. To address this problem, we define the no mono predicate. The idea is that if no mono does not hold, then we can monomorphize the program. For instance, the box program earlier, no mono holds, and we cannot monomorphize this program. In the paper, we show that if no mono doesn't hold for a program, then it is monomorphizable. We also show that monomorphization preserves typing and that it preserves and reflects the semantics of FGG. For the reflection direction of this result, there is a subtlety due to the structural subtyping of Go, which Ray will explain with our tool in the next part of this talk. We can demonstrate one of the ways that Go structural subtyping impacts on monomorphization and show you there's an implementation that you can play with as well. So our monomorphization is based on statically collecting all potential instances of generic types and methods, which might lead us to think that types and methods that aren't used, ones that we don't find instances of, could be just discarded. Actually, it's not as simple as that. Let's look at a small example. We have here the empty interface, which we name as any, and we'll use this helper struct called toAny, which just wraps other structs of any type. We have the list interface with this map method. The exact signature of this method isn't important for this example, just that it's a generic method with a type parameter. So we have to consider it when it comes to monomorphization. And we have the nil struct, which implements the list interface because it implements this map method. In our main function, we just create a nil. We use our helper struct to effectively upcast that to the any type. And then we use a type assertion to try to downcast that back to the list interface type. This FGG program is perfectly fine as it is because nil is an implementation of list. Let's try monomorphizing this program in a naive way by discounting methods that aren't used like map. We can do that using the FGG tool. Here is the monomorphization output. You can see the list interface has basically become the empty interface because map is never used and the nil struct has no method declarations. This is just a standard Go program now, so we can use standard non-generic Go to run it. And this succeeds, which means the type assertion succeeds, but that's just because the types happen to have lost all their methods here. If we were to break the program like so, if we re-monomorphize that, actually gives exactly the same output and so if we run it again using go this still succeeds but it's incorrect because what we want is the type assertion to fail because nil no longer implements list we can also use the fgg tool to dynamically check the simulation property between fgg and monomorphized programs here we have the initial fgg expression from the main function and that's the monomorphized version after one step, both are trying the type assertion, but unfortunately the FGG expression is stuck, meaning here that the type assertion doesn't go through as intended, but as we saw the monomorphized version does go through, which is incorrect. To deal with this, we introduce what we call dummy methods into the monomorphization. A dummy method represents a generic method, even if it's not used and so has no instances. If we look at the actual monomorphization by removing this bogus no dummy flag, you can see that list has a dummy version of the map method. The implementation just uses name angling. And if we run this now, we get the correct behavior, which is a panic because the type assertion fails because nil doesn't implement the map method. For completeness, if we do fix the program, and re-monomorphize that, you'll see that not only list has the dummy method, but also the nil struct in order to preserve the subtyping between nil and list. If you'd like to try the tool, the source code is available from here. It's written in Go and it includes FG and FGG interpreters, static type checking, static nomono checking, and the monomorphizer. You can use the main branch for the latest version. Our artifact also includes FGG gen, which is an FGG program enumerator. It can generate well typed FGG programs up to a certain size measured in syntactic constructors. Our artifact uses that to feed generated programs through the tool to test, for example, the simulation property between FGG programs and monomorphized programs. There's also the official prototype by the Go team you can try the online code playground here. A small note, the Go team has changed the syntax from parentheses to 
square brackets after we submitted this paper. Uh, the official prototype also doesn't yet support a couple of features that we've presented, such as generic methods and static nomonal checking. So just to wrap up our talk, I'd like to briefly mention some of the consequences of our collaboration with the Go team. Namely, after our involvement, the contract-based proposals to generics were essentially dropped. And in fact, the current proposal for generics is based on interfaces as developed in our work on FG and FGG. And overall, our work essentially helped clarify various features of the design at both the foundational level and the practical levels. And that's all for our talk. You can look at our paper for more details or ask us questions just in the next session. Thank you.